Our study this week, it is the second study that we are doing in a series of studies that's being done out of the epistle to the Hebrews, where we are taking a look at the six great warnings that we find in this letter. In our study last week, just in case you missed that study, we took a look at the warning about neglecting salvation and how when you neglect salvation, you will drift away. That sets the tone essentially for all of the warnings that we will be covering over the next few weeks with the major warning that we find throughout scripture anyway, to where again, Jesus said, as it is recorded in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So there is a warning that the Lord gave to mankind that if you don't believe in the only begotten Son of God, you will perish. You will not have everlasting life with the Father in his heavenly kingdom. So again, here in our study this week, we are going to be focusing in on scripture that is going to be taking place from the third chapter of Hebrews, where we are going to look at scripture that runs from the seventh verse through the fourth chapter and the third verse, where again, we are going to be taking a look at, in our study this week, a warning about hardening your heart. When I think about hardening your heart, I think about how Pharaoh, how his heart, it was hardened. And in scripture, the scripture in the book of Exodus, it would make it seem like the Lord purposely was hardening the heart of Pharaoh, but that was not the case. Pharaoh, we have to think about Pharaoh, he was a man that was full of pride. He was full of ego. He thought himself to be a god. And so with uh, Israel in Egypt and with Moses coming to Egypt and saying to Pharaoh, hey, free Israel, my, 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 my God says to let my people go, you know, Pharaoh was thinking to himself, well, who is above me? And with plague after plague after plague, you would think that Pharaoh would realize his place, but, but Pharaoh did not relent. He was stubborn. His heart, it was hardened. So there is a very great danger when one chooses to harden their heart rather than soften their heart. And that's what we essentially we'll be taking a look at here in our study for this week. So let us go ahead and let us start diving into the scripture there that is again taking place from the third chapter of Hebrews. We're going to start there at the seventh verse, where in the seventh verse, the scripture it reads, it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, underline that, underline the fact that the Holy Spirit says today. We're going to talk about that in a moment. It says there today, if you will hear his voice, and we'll go ahead and take the eighth verse as well there. The eighth verse says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So what do you think it means to harden? How would you define that? You heard me mention, you heard me mention stubbornness. Now, when we look at the dictionary, good old Miriam Webster, we'll see that the Dictionary defines to harden, to confirm in disposition, to confirm in disposition, feelings, or action, to become firm, stable, or settled. That is how the dictionary defines that word. Do you yourself, do you ever harden your heart? I want you to think about that for, for a moment here, because I think that right away, since our study is a warning about hardening your heart, I think right away many of you will say, no, I don't do that, Pastor. I don't do that. But I would say to you today that I myself, I am very steadfast in my faith. So I would say to all of you today that my heart is hardened. I'm, I am very stubborn when it comes to my faith in the Lord. You're not going to make me budge on my faith. The only thing that I desire to do in my heart is to keep growing in my faith. I want to grow in my knowledge. I want to grow in my wisdom. I want to grow in my understanding of the Lord. I want to grow in my fellowship in with, with, with the Lord as well, because 
So long as I am growing in my faith, I know that I can overcome all of the obstacles that I face in my life. I'm going to have good days, but again, I'm going to have bad days. And again, I know that so long as I keep growing in my faith, that the bad is not going to make me budge on, on my faith. And again, we know about our great adversary. And so I imagine that that our great adversary, the devil, uh, that he's not a big fan of me because my heart, it is hardened, again, when it comes to trusting in the Lord. So again, think about that for, for a moment. Harden, okay, hardening your heart there. Now, we'll see there in that seven verse, again, taking a look at that, that seven verse there, we'll see there, again, that the writer to, to the Hebrews here in this epistle said, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, so this is coming from, from being guided by the Holy Spirit, today, like I said, I had you all underline that, that word there because that word is of great significance. It is of great importance there. He said, today, if you will hear his voice, that is talking about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So talking about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, what that statement implies there, the fact that the writer uses the word today there in that verse, it would imply that yesterday that there were some, or Israel, the Hebrews, that they did not listen to the voice of the Spirit. They did not listen to the voice of God. If you remember our study from last week, if we turn over there to the second chapter, and let us again remember what's said there in that first verse, where the writer said there again to, to the Jewish community, to the community of the Jews there, he said, therefore we must Give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, if you remember what I said in, in the study last week when, when I was talking about the community of the Jews there that the writer was speaking to, the warning was not directed to those Jews who had believed. It, it is not directed to the Jews who had heeded the gospel, those that heeded the good news of, of Christ that Christ came, that yes, he died for our sins. He became our propitiation so that we can have an eternal home with the Father. That message, that warning that, that we studied about last week and then the warning that we see today, it cannot be directed to anyone that has heeded the good news. It cannot be directed to anyone who was attentive and who is attentive to the word of God. It can only be directed to those who have not received the word of God. Like I said in last week's study, there are many who profess to believe in the only begotten Son of God, but they don't actually live by faith. They just have the, the profession where, as you have heard me say before, real faith lies within the confession of your heart and yes, I, I beat, I, I pat my chest, but I want you to understand, I'm not talking about the heart that beats. I'm talking about the, the inner man. Real faith lies within our soul. And, and when real faith lies within your soul, then you will move by that faith. And so the warning that we studied last week, the warning that we're studying today, when the writer said, today, if you will hear his voice, the writer is directing this message to those who did not listen yesterday. Okay, those who, who were not attentive to, to the word of God. And again, to, to re explain that, that community once again to you, because there, there are many who are in that community today, even though I use the Jews here because the, the letter is written to, to the Hebrews there. There were, and there still are many today, who have not fully walked by faith. They have heard of God, but they have not accepted God. They haven't truly listened to his word. They haven't truly been attentive to his voice. And then again, there are others out there who are fully convicted to living in sin. They indulge in sin. So I would say to all of you today, yes, this warning, it can be meant for them but many of those who are in that crowd, those who are fully convicted of living in sin, they don't care. So this warning is to all of those who are still, in a manner of speaking, 
would be open to receiving, to fully receiving the word of God. This warning is for, for them there. And so we'll then see there, as we take a look at the eighth verse, the writer said again, do not harden your hearts. So again, let us understand that to harden means to confirm in disposition. To harden means to, to confirm in feelings, to confirm in actions, to, to again, like I said, be steadfast. You're, you're not moving. You're not bold. You're not, you're not budging from, from, from your stance there. To become firm is how that word is defined. To be stable or to be settled. You, you are, again, not budging. You are being steadfast. But here, the writer says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. Now, with that statement, some of us, we, we may not understand what is meant there, okay, where the writer says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You know, we will begin to wonder, well, what rebellion is the writer talking about there? The writer said, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Some of us, again, may be wondering, well, what is the writer talking about? Rebellion, wilderness, what is going on here? What is it that the writer is talking about? We have to remember that the writer is, again, this, this letter, this epistle, it was directed to the Jews. So that statement there, it would definitely mean something to, or it would have meant something to the Jews in that day, where, again, he mentions the rebellion, uh, he mentions the, the trial in the wilderness. Right? We, we need to understand what is being spoken of there. Because now we see where something that had happened in the past for Israel is now being brought up. So what was it that happened in the past? We, we, must, we must dive into that, and we are, we are going to dive into that. Before we even really dive into that, I do need to make a mention that we're starting to, there in that seventh verse, and, and then it carries on from the eighth through the eleventh verse, all of this is a reference that is being quoted from the 95th Psalm. So if we turn over to the 95th Psalm, let's turn over there to the, the 95th Psalm there so that we can see it. If, if you want to, you can pause the video so that you can read all of what was said there uh, in the third chapter of Hebrews. But I want us to turn over now to the 95th Psalm so that we can see what's said there in the 95th Psalm. When you get there to the 95th Psalm, let's take a look at the scripture from the 7th through the 11th verse there. Again, you can pause the video. You can pause the audio if you want to read what was both in the, the third chapter of Hebrews and here in the 95th Psalm. We'll see there in the 95th Psalm there. I'm going to start again at the 7th verse there, where the 7th verse there, it says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The we there... Uh, is in reference to the Israelites. This is a psalm of David. So David is talking about his people. That is, again, the, the people of Israel. All of those that were of the lineage of Israel is being spoken to there. We are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hand. I do want to make a mention, as I believe I mentioned this in last week's study. I may have mentioned it in the sermon. I can't remember. But you often will hear me reference the 10th chapter of John's gospel where Jesus speaks about being the true shepherd. And I also often reference that 16th verse there in the 10th chapter of John's gospel where Jesus, he talks about there being one flock and that one flock is made up of not just the Jews, but it is also made up of the Gentiles who Jesus said that he has to go. There's other sheep of, of a fold that I need to go and I need to bring uh, with me. And so the Jews and the Gentiles, we are all of one fold. So if you want to, and again, this is essentially going to be implied there in, in the third chapter of Hebrews, we are all now the sheep of the pastor of Christ. And when I say we, I want to be clear about this. I'm talking about all who sincerely believe, all those who actually sincerely live and move by faith. So again, there, Taking a look back at that, 70, that, that 95th Psalm, I should say, that seven verse, it says there, he said, today, if you will hear his voice. That sounds familiar, right? We, we just saw that uh, in the seventh verse in, in the third chapter of Hebrews. Now, take a look at that eighth verse there. The eighth verse says there, and again, this is going to sound familiar, says, 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So again, like I said, this, what we read over in the third chapter of Hebrews, it is essentially a direct quote to what we're seeing here in the 95th Psalm. The 95th Psalm is actually one that I often use uh, in my call to worship. I often use the the opening scripture there in the 95th Psalm where David, he was calling on the people to, to sing to the Lord, to, to praise God there. He said, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. He was calling for the people to come together and to worship and, and to praise the Lord. And so, again, there in that seventh and in the eighth verse there in the 95th Psalm, he's again urging the people to, to worship the Lord because they are the sheep of his pastor. And so, again, you know, if, if you are one of God's children, you should certainly worship him because he, he is worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your praise, right? And so that's what David was doing there. And again, he said, today, if you will hear his voice at that point in time, he said, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, he said there. So what was the rebellion in the day of the trial in wilderness that we continue to, to see here that was quoted over in the third chapter of Hebrews and what David, he brings up here in the 95th Psalm? What is the rebellion? And again, what was the trial in the wilderness? Now, if we take a look at the 10th verse there in the 95th Psalm, we get a hint. Uh, if we turn back over to the third chapter of Hebrews and we take a look at the ninth verse, we will get a hint as well. Let's take a look at the ninth and the tenth verse there in the 95th Psalm so that we can have a lead in to that tenth verse. The ninth verse, it says, When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years, it says there in the tenth verse, says, For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. Now, that, that's a hint for us, right? When it comes to the rebellion, when it comes to this trial in the wilderness, right? Now, again, if we, if we turn back over to the third chapter of uh, Hebrews and we take a look at the ninth verse, essentially we're going to see the same thing here. Where there in the ninth verse it says, Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Again, this is a major hint for us there. And then again, there in that 10th verse, essentially we see the same thing there in the 10th verse where it says, therefore I was angry with that generation that said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. These are again words of the Lord. Again, through the Holy Spirit, as the writer of, of, of the letter to the Hebrews, the Hebrews said there. So this rebellion, this trial in the wilderness it has something, again, to do with Israel, but it has something to do, to do with Israel before the days of David. Now, for all of you who still may not have any idea, even after the hint about the 40 years, what's the significance of 40 years that, that we can remember in Scripture? Wouldn't it be that Israel was made to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Now, do you know what caused them? the reason behind why they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Why did God make Israel, why did he make the children of Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Now, if you are struggling with, with finding an answer to that question, let us turn over to the book of Numbers and we will be able to get our answers. Let's turn over to the book of Numbers, all the way back in the Old Testament is Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And when you get over to Numbers, we are going to take a look at Scripture that actually begins at the end of the 12th chapter of Numbers. And, and it works its way all the way through the 14th chapter of Numbers. Now, don't you worry. We're not going to dissect each Scripture, each verse in the 12th the 13th and the 14th chapter of Numbers. But we are going to go over what it was that happened in, in this rebellion, what it was that happened in the wilderness. Because, again, the writer, uh, the letter to the Hebrews is saying, don't do 
what they did. So we must know what they did. This is a warning again. The writer is warning us, don't follow the example that Israel set in the rebellion and in the wilderness. Now, if you take a look there at the the 12th chapter of Numbers and you take a look at the 16th verse, that is the last verse in the 12th chapter of Numbers, you'll see that it is written, it says, and afterward the people moved from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Haran. The reason why I mention that is because I just want to set the location because the wilderness of Paran is of great significance because this is where the rebellion truly occurred. This is where the trial in the wilderness, where it occurred, in the wilderness of Paran. Now, when we take a look there at the first verse, we'll take a look at the first and the second verse. We'll see what it was that had began to happen in the wilderness of Paran. We're told there in the first verse of the 13th chapter of Numbers, it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, every one a leader among them. That's what we see there in the first and the second verse. The significance there is what's said there at the beginning of the second verse, where again, we're told in the first verse that God is speaking to Moses. And what is it that the Lord tells Moses to do? He tells Moses to send men to spy out the land of Canaan. Do you know the significance of the land of Canaan? Yes, it's, it's the modern day Palestine that is being fought over now. But that land is truly significant when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to, to Israel, the children of Israel. The significance of it is given to us there in that second verse where the Lord says, I am giving to the children of Israel. He is giving to them the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is the promised land, the land that, that Abraham once dwelt in. Abraham was told to, to go to that land, and he dwelt in that land for a period of time. But that land, it suffered drought. It would have tremendous droughts in that land. And so by the time of Jacob, who was known as Israel, he and his children had to go over into Egypt, which eventually led to the children of Israel being in bondage. But the land, it was promised to Abraham. It was promised to Isaac. It was promised to Jacob, who again was later known as Israel. And then that promise was carried on down to his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so God promised them the land and he sent Moses to Egypt to again set the children of Israel free from the bondage of Egypt. And from Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. They made it to Mount Sinai, right? And then from Mount Sinai, they made it to the wilderness of Paran. Now, I want you to understand that journey from Mount Sinai or from Egypt to initially to the wilderness of Paran, it didn't take 40 years. It didn't take them that long at all. It took them a couple of years to get there. And so they reached a point well, there we see there in the first and the second verse in the 13th chapter of Numbers to where the Lord tells Moses to send 12 spies over into the promised land. God has brought Israel to the point of them being able to go over into the promised land. When, when we talk about the promised land, I want you to see the promised land as a blessing. It was a blessing, a promised blessing from the Lord to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then to the children of Israel. Now, when God has promised you a blessing, and he says that your blessing is right over there, what do you think you should do? You should probably get up and go over to that blessing, right? Even if there are barriers and obstacles before you, and I just preached about this recently, to where if there's a door shut, we should go and we should, we should knock on that door and we should keep knocking until that door is open, right? That's what should have happened, right? But again, as we take a look here at the 13th chapter of Numbers, we'll see there when we get down to the 26th verse, if you read from the 3rd verse through the 20th verse, you can actually see the names of the spies that that went over to spy out the promised land. We're not going to go over those names. They, 
they aren't of much significance for our study here today. But when we take a look at the 26th verse, we'll see there in the 26th verse, it says, Now they departed, they there being the, the 12 spies that were supposed to go over into the promised land. It says, Now they departed, and then we'll see that they came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. That's what we see there in the 26th verse. It says there in the 26th verse that they, the spies, they brought back word to them. That's all the people there. It says there to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they went over into the promised land. They spied in the promised land. And now they are reporting back to Moses, to Aaron, and to all the children, to the rest of the children of Israel. We'll see there in the 27th verse. The scripture says, then they, that is again is the spies, the 12 spies says, then they told him, the him there being Moses, and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So they start off talking about the promised land. And again, let's, let's refer to that promised land as a blessing. Okay, I want you to keep in mind that they're talking about God's promised blessing here. Initially, it sounds fine. Everything sounds fine here, right? They go over, they say that the land, it, the blessing, it truly was flowing with milk and honey, okay? And he said, hey, this is its fruit. That's what they said there. But now take a look at that 28 verse because this is where the rebellion, this is where the trial in the wilderness, this is where, where it begins. We'll see there in the 28 verse, that the spies say, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities, they are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Then the 29th verse, we'll see there in the 29th verse that they mentioned the Amalekites, they mentioned the Hittites, the Jebusites, the, the Amorites that, that dwelt in the land. These would be enemies of Israel. These, the, the spies are saying, hey, these, these people, they live there, they're going to be our adversaries, they're going to be, they're going to be threat, right? That's what we see them saying there. Now, if we skip what Caleb says there in the 30th verse, we're going to come back to that 30th verse in a moment. We'll see there in the 31st verse that the men who had gone up with him, that's with Caleb, that's, uh, you know, Caleb spoke there uh, in the 30th verse. They said, we are not able to go up against the people. So they said, those, those spies that there, they, they, they say that we're not able to go up against the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, that's, that's mentioned there in the 29th verse. They say that, that we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now, I don't know if you realize what those spies that are speaking essentially against the land, they're speaking against the blessing. They're speaking wickedly against the blessing. I don't think you realize what they are truly doing here. Yes, it, it may seem like they are giving a warning about the land. It may seem like they're giving a warning about the people. Some of us may say, oh, what's wrong with, with what they're saying? They're simply warning Moses and, and the people. They, they see a danger. They see a threat. And so there should be nothing wrong with, with not wanting to go over and, and face what what they could potentially face in land, right? That's that's what some of us may may think. But I want you to understand that when they say there in the 31st verse that we are not able to go up against the people, they're not just talking about the children of Israel. They're talking about God as well because the children of Israel, who are they supposed to lean on? Yes, they were supposed to lean on each other, right? Yes, they were supposed to lean on their leadership, but their leadership wasn't necessarily Moses and Aaron. It just wasn't those two. It was also God as well. So when they say there that we are not able to go up against the people, they are including God in this as well. But God, he is able to overcome everyone, right? Who is it that can stand up against God? Somebody say, oh, the devil, he's on equal plane. The devil is not on equal plane with the Lord. The devil cannot stand up to, to the Lord. And certainly man cannot stand up to the Lord. God overcomes everything because he is almighty. He is all powerful. There is no one that can stand to the Lord and even defeat God, let alone touch the Lord. 
But again, there in that 31st verse, the spies, they say there, hey, we aren't able to go up against. They didn't think that they would be able to defeat the people that were in the land. So they are speaking evil against the people, all right, the, the children of Israel, doubting what the children of Israel can do. They are speaking evil against God, doubting what God can do. And at the same time, I don't know if you catch this as well, but they are also speaking against the blessing, the promised blessing from the Lord. Now, take a look at what Caleb says there in the 30th verse. In the 30th verse, Caleb, he quieted the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. So Caleb, he he has, I guess you could say, a difference of opinion, someone someone may say here, where you have other spies saying the promise, the promised land, the land of Canaan, yes, it flows with it flows with milk and honey, but the people in the land, they they are too much for us. Essentially, they are saying, hey, we want to preserve our life. There's no reason for us to go over into that land and to die because we are unable to overcome the people in the land. Whereas you have Caleb here, who again there in that 30th verse says, don't, don't listen to that. No, let us go now. He says, let us go up at once. Let us take possession for we are well able to overcome it. So why was Caleb, why did he feel differently about it? Well, Caleb, he was he was different from the other spies because he was of faith. Caleb realized that that the onus wasn't on, on them. It wasn't like that they were going to go over to the land and take on the people by themselves. Caleb knew that they had God on their side as well. And so again, with God on your side, who is it that can defeat you? Who is it that can, can beat you? Who is it that can overcome you? Nobody. Because again, God is fighting with you and for you. And nobody, there is nothing that is overcoming the Lord. So this is essentially a rebuke. This is a rebuke from Caleb here. Because Caleb, again, he is he desires to move in faith here. All right? He desires to move in faith. You got to believe that Moses desired to move in faith as well. They desire to move in faith. And so now Israel, they are left with the choice to make here, right? Are they going to heed the, the spies that are speaking evil against God, his blessing? Or are they going to heed the rebuke from Caleb, which was a rebuke out of faith? What would they do? Now, when we turn over to the 14th chapter, we'll see there in the 14th chapter, there in the first verse, it says, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people, they wept. It told, uh, we see there, the people wept that night. And then there in the second verse, we're told, it says there, all the children of Israel complained. They complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness, they say there. So they they have two different words here, right? They have the spies that, that are speaking against. They have Caleb with his rebuke, a rebuke that is of faith. They sleep on it that night. And the choice that they make is to not listen to the rebuke, not listen to the one who's speaking of faith in the Lord, but listen to the ones that don't believe. And so, again, there's a choice that we find in the world today. There is a promised land, right? And I want you to understand that when I say there is a promised land, I am not talking about the land of Canaan. I'm talking about a land that is far greater than the land of Canaan. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, his heavenly kingdom. It has been promised to us again. Third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, what did it say? Whosoever believes in the only begotten Son of God will not perish but have everlasting life. Where is it that we will have everlasting life? 
If we take a look at the 14th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said, I am going away to prepare a place for you in my father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. Jesus said, I am going to come again and I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Where is Jesus at today? He sits at the right hand of majesty, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. That's, again, what we see in Scripture. Jesus today is in the heavenly kingdom. When the sincere believer, when the saint passes away today, the believer goes to be with him, goes to be with Christ. There is a promised land out there, and I just delivered a word to you about that promised land. And again, as I said in last week's study, I am not the only one that ministers the good news, that ministers the gospel. There are several other preachers and pastors and ministers and evangelists and, and many other believers that go out and they take part in the Great Commission, letting all people know that they can be saved by faith through the grace of God and go on to inherit the heavenly kingdom. The word of God, it is freely available today. And there is a choice that all people have to make. Are you going to heed the word of God or are you going to, as we saw in our study last week, are you going to neglect it? Are you going to dismiss it? Are you going to disregard it? Again, there is a warning against neglecting salvation, right? And so, again, the children of Israel today, they are being used as an example for what took place in the wilderness of Paran. Because right now, in that 14th chapter, what we see is that the children of Israel, they have complained against Moses and Aaron. And though it may seem like they are complaining against the two men, I want you to understand that they are also complaining against God as well. Because Moses and Aaron, yes, while they were leading Israel, Moses and Aaron, they were following the lead of who? Who was it that led the children of Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night? Was it not the Lord? So it was God that was leading the children of Israel. And so the children of Israel, though they are complaining against Moses and Aaron, they are also complaining against God as well. Will they continue down that path or will they be moved out of that path? Will they be moved or, or will they hearts harden, right? So if we take a look there at the third verse, look at what's said here in the third verse there in the 14th chapter we we'll see that the people, they say, why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? This is what they are saying about the blessing, right? They're saying, hey, we don't want the blessing. Why not let us go back away from the blessing? Let's go back to a land where we were held in bondage, where you, where you were held in bondage. You were free in the wilderness, right? The promised land, it has been promised to you, a land flowing with milk and honey to, to where you'll be able to live free. And you're desiring to go back? So that's what they're saying there in, in that third verse. Now, I want us to skip down to the sixth verse. There in the sixth verse, we see Joshua begins to speak. So we have now Joshua speaking. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, we're told there in the sixth verse, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And there in the seventh verse, we'll see that it says, they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. There in the eighth verse, we'll see that they say, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. So again, we're seeing a rebuke here that's now coming from, from both Joshua and Caleb. They're the two out of the 12 spies that are for going over into the land. There are 10 spies, therefore, that's against it, all right? There are two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who are for. They are about faith, and they're about moving by faith. They said, hey, if we go over there, God is going to delight in us. He's going to favor us, and we are going to be able to take possession of the land Again, the land is a blessing, so they're saying that God, with his favor, him favoring us, we are going to receive, we're going to take possession of the blessing 
that the Lord has, again, guaranteed, has promised to us. It says there again, as we take a look at the end of that eighth verse, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now in the ninth verse, there's a plea here from the two. They say there, only do not rebel against the Lord. They're pleading there. Don't rebel. Don't go against God, right? Don't go against his desires. His desires for was for Israel to go over into the promised land, right? So they say, do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. They are ready to move by faith. And so again, we have two spies here that is putting the onus on the children of Israel. They are, they are giving them a way out of rebelling against God, a way out of going against God. Would the hearts of the children of Israel, would it soften here? Or would their hearts harden here? Take a look at what they do there in the 10th verse. Take a look, take a close look at what happens here in the 10th verse. In the 10th verse, we are told, all the congregation said to stone them with stones. It doesn't sound like their hearts softened, does it? No, their hearts, they hardened. Said, the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Here comes God. The people, their hearts have hardened. They are speaking against not simply Moses and Aaron. They're not simply speaking against Joshua and Caleb. They are speaking against God. They are also speaking against God's blessing. How do you think the Lord will feel about this? The actions of the people rebelling. They are rebelling against God and his guaranteed, his promised blessing. How do you think the Lord will react? How do you think the Lord will feel? Let us take a look there at the 11th verse. We'll take a look at the 11th. We'll take a look at that 11th verse. We'll take a look at the 12th verse as well. We'll see there in the 11th verse says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? He asked there. With all the signs which I have performed against among them. This is the sad part about it, right? We have to consider that those who were, were rebelling here at this point were those who were in Egypt, and they saw the plagues, they saw the works of God in Egypt. And now they don't have the faith to believe that they can go over and, and take possession of the promised land. They are taking the word of, of 10 spies over Joshua, over Caleb, over Moses, over Aaron, most importantly, over God, who has promised the, the, the promised land to them. They are taking the word of those who are rebels over those who are of faith. Their hearts, instead of being encouraged and persuaded away from, from siding with the ten spies, the people, their hearts have hardened. Their hearts have hardened in the wrong direction. Like I said earlier, my heart, it is hardened for, for the Lord. You can't make me budge when it comes to, to my faith in God. The people here, their hearts, they've hardened in the wrong direction. And this is a great danger, as we'll see the Lord say there in the 12th verse, and the Lord is saying this to Moses, listen to these words there. The Lord says, I will strike them. I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. He said, again, pay close attention. I want you to underline. I want you to highlight because this is the danger of hardening your heart against the Lord and his word. And most importantly, his promise. He says, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you, he's talking to Moses here, a nation greater and mightier than they. This calls Moses, if you take a look at and we're not going to go over the rest of this chapter, this calls Moses to have to intercede on behalf of the people. Because the Lord, he was angry. He was not happy. He was not pleased with what the children of Israel were doing in rebelling against him. Now, again, if we turn over to the, the third chapter of Hebrews there, 
we'll see there in again in that tenth verse, where where the Lord said there. Says therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they not they have not known my ways. And then look at that eleven verse there, where it says there. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so we know that the children of Israel from that point, that generation, they were made to wander in the wilderness for forty years. So they all died out. They were not allowed to inherit the promised land. They didn't get to see it. They didn't get to enter into it. Their children did. They didn't get to do it. Do you see a parallel? I said that there is a promised land today. And I said that promised land, I ain't talking about the land of Canaan. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. I'm talking about the promised land of heaven. If you harden your heart today, do you think that you will be able to inherit the promised land, the promised land of the kingdom of heaven? Well, again, did the children of Israel, did they inherit the promised land, the land of Canaan? Those that rebelled against the Lord, they did not. This is, again, the great warning. This is why the writer uses Israel there. This is why he used the children of Israel in the wilderness in Paran. Because again, this is the rebellion. This is the trial in the wilderness. The children of Israel, they failed the trial. They had a chance. They had an opportunity to soften their hearts, but their hearts didn't soften. Their hearts, they hardened. So again, we... We cannot let our hearts be hard today when we have so great a promise, which again, we, we spoke about in our study last week. We have a promise of salvation. That is a promise of deliverance from sin, deliverance from Satan, deliverance from this wicked world, or again, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And again, you and I, we, we should not disregard these warnings. Even though these warnings, again, they are not directed to the sincere believer, when I say we, I'm talking about we as in mankind. I'm talking to all people, not just, not just believers. I'm talking to all people, especially all of those who are not living in a manner into which they are convicted to live in sin. I'm talking about the ones who are drifting, as we saw in our study last week. I'm talking to all of those who simply are living in a world with no care about what happens to them after this physical life. I would plead with those who live in a manner to where they don't care to start caring and, and to open up their hearts to receive the word of God. We'll see it said there in the, the 12th and the 13th verse, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living of God the living God. The 13th verse says, but exhort one another daily, which I just did, while it is called today, lest, if, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And there in the 14th verse, we'll see that the writer, the writer then said, for we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said there in the 15th verse, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Again, the writer said there that we have become partakers of Christ. That means that we are to take part in Christ. So we are to live like Christ. And, and Christ, he lived in this wicked world, suffering uh, in, in this world for, for our sins. You and I, we are going to have our trials. We are going to have our tribulations. We are going to have our afflictions. We are going to suffer because of our faith in the only begotten Son of God. But again, we must be steadfast in, in our faith. So th that part of the message certainly is direct a message that, that we as sincere believers uh, can heed as well to, again, just take part in it and, again, this is essentially a, uh, an invitation. It is uh, some encouragement to all of those 
who had not yet committed themselves to fully walking in faith in Christ. Again, the, the warning that we have seen so far today is don't harden your heart because, again, the end result uh, of hardening your heart is one who will not be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven. They will be disinherited from the kingdom of heaven. And again, we essentially, like I said at the start, this that's essentially the warning throughout Scripture for mankind. And yet we know that God, he desires to dwell with us. He desires to dwell with us in his kingdom, right? And so that's essentially, again, the warning that if you are not of faith in him, you will perish. You will not be able to have everlasting life with him. Now, as we start to come to a close here in our study, we'll see there in the fourth the fourth chapter, I'm going to skip over the, the 16th through the 19th verse there in the third chapter because that's essentially kind of a summary of, of everything that we went over in uh, the, the book of Numbers. But we'll see there in the fourth chapter when we take a look at the uh, first verse there, We'll take a look here at the first three verses there in the fourth chapter where it says, therefore, since a promise remains, okay? It says, therefore, since a promise remains, and this promise, the writer tells us, is of entering his rest. We're talking again about the kingdom of heaven. Like I said, there is a land of promise that is still promised today, and that land of promise is the kingdom of God, his rest the heavenly kingdom, a rest from from wickedness and sin, right? So there's a premise of everlasting joy, everlasting peace. The writer says there in that first verse, says, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Let us fear. What are we, what are we supposed to fear? Well, we are supposed to fear missing out on the promise, we, we are to, to fear being disinherited from the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, which again has been promised not to just one people, not just to one nation of people. For God so loved the world, he gave the world his only begotten son, that whosoever, it is a promise to, to all people. And so we should fear missing out on that promise. And in fearing missing out on that promise, how should we live? Well, we we should live heeding the word of God, as we saw again in our study last week. We should earnestly heed, listen to, be attentive to the word of God, living in obedience, keeping his word. Said again, he said there, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. The second verse says, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And then we'll see there in the third verse, it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So again, that rest, it is promised again to everyone. Now, is everyone going to enter into that rest? No. Who is it that will enter into that rest? All of those that were God-fearing people, that in their fear, they chose to heed his word, and they chose to be obedient. That is who will enter into that rest. Again, it has been promised to us. So today, what we should take away from, from this study is this. Don't play around when it comes to the word of God. Don't, don't harden your hearts thinking that, that your way is the way, that it is the right way, and, and you're living in a manner, you're living in a way that goes completely against the doctrine of God. If you live in that manner, you're not going to be rewarded with in, inheriting the kingdom of heaven. That's not going to be your reward. You are going to be disinherited from the kingdom of God. So, again, we must take this warning with great seriousness. And when I say we, I'm talking about us as mankind. The sincere believer, if you are already, again, a sincere believer, if you genuinely are moving in sincere faith, you are living 
fellow in fellowship with the Lord, this warning is not directed to you, but it is certainly directed to all of those who are not. It is directed especially to those who will be open to heeding the warning. So if you are not convicted to living in sin, I, again, I encourage you today, heed this warning. The kingdom of heaven, again, I say to you, it's meant for you. All you have to do is heed the word of God, listen, be attentive to the word of God, and then move by faith. All right? So that is our study for this week. Again, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I don't have a timing on it, so if it was a longer study, I do apologize if it was a longer study, but I, again, I enjoy these studies. I can go on and on and on forever. But again, I do hope that you enjoyed this lesson or this study, and I hope that you will share this study with somebody somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our study next week. Our study next week is going to be one that I actually, I kind of did it last year, where we are going to be taking a look at a warning about being dull of hearing. That's going to be a really good study. So I certainly hope that you'll come back for our study next week. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.